What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, this is, I don't know, you know, I'm here with Bram and Jennifer, as you can see. I'm going to introduce them formally in a second, but I don't know if I've given away product on an episode before. So if you're watching live, this is going to be, you probably are listening maybe later on, but if you're watching live, we're going to give away product. Um, and if you can look, if you're seeing the screen, you see these beautiful, delicious jars of this Belgium chocolate spread, Letco. So we're gonna give away, before I introduce everything, we're gonna give away a couple jars of these. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose in the comments, um, what would you eat chocolate on? It may We may rate on weirdness, our favorites. I don't know how we're gonna rate them, but what do you like to eat chocolate with? And extra bonus points, if you've tried Letco and you tell us what you like eating Letco on. All right. For me, I actually, um, I've tried a bunch of the flavors. I actually like putting it um, on bananas, but I also like putting it in my smoothies so that I have a nice, rich chocolate dessert smoothie. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about all the, all the benefits of let go, but I encourage people to check out other episodes of the podcast. I've had some amazing founders, uh, the founders of RX bars. I like profiling people, Jennifer and Bram, who I really love their product and I consume it. So I've had RX bars, Truth Bars, Wild Tonic Kombucha, and, and many Big League Chew. Um, that He was a blast. Check out other episodes of the podcast. Before I introduce Bram and Jennifer, um, and you could put any comments in the whole time and we'll, we'll check them afterwards. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. Um, we do that by helping you run your podcast. And I, you know, Bram and Jennifer, you, we've known each other for a little bit, but the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I've seen no better way over the past over decade to profile the people and the brands and the companies that I respect and love and shout them out from the rooftops and let them talk about what they're working on. So if anyone out there has thought about starting a podcast, we've been doing it for over 10 years and you can go to rise25.com and check it out. Uh, now, this was inspired by family trips to Belgium, enjoying breakfast featuring dark chocolate spread. Uh, Bram, and Jen uh, Bram and Jennifer Bourgeois started Letco to bring a 50-year-old Belgian dark chocolate spread recipe to the United States. And some of the best companies I've seen, Bram General, they take something from another country, they innovate, and they bring it to the U.S. where it's normal somewhere else and it's not normal in that country. Like, you look at coconut water, right? People walking around Brazil, it's like hanging from, you know, it's everywhere. But people in the U.S. just love it. So, but what's unique about Letco is... You know, there's a rise of nut, dairy, and gluten allergies and diabetes. Um, and what Letco allows everyone to do is indulge without the worry. It's an all natural. It's nut free, gluten free, dairy free, vegan, non GMO, dark Belgian chocolate spread recipe that's lower in sugar and calories. So it makes it a more guilt free treat. So thank you both for joining me. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. That's pretty accurate, right? Yeah. What yeah. would you add into that? Oh. I think it's healthy indulgence. Uh, I think you did a fantastic job. Great job on the pronunciation of the last name. So <laughs> one. That, that should be a, uh, a test uh, to spell it as well. But no, you did a great job. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. We appreciate the acknowledgement as well. Talk about I the guess. evolution of the flavors for a second, right? So what you started with and uh, you know what you went with next, because it's, it's, a serious decision from an inventory and manufacturing perspective too. Yeah. Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. You take that one, Jen. Okay. So, and you'll, you'll learn through the podcast um, who's American, who's Belgian. And we come from different countries where, you know, really the culture, the upbringing, the lifestyle, there's different things that you remember from your childhood and from your home country. 
Um, you know, as we grew up with peanut butter and jelly here, in the United States, Belgians grow up with chocolate all the time from, from birth to death. They're eating chocolate. It's a fantastic country. I feel to grow up in that you can have chocolate for breakfast. In fact, I kind of giggled the first time I was over there. I'm like, I grew up on wheat germ. You're eating chocolate for breakfast. What the heck? <laughs> so it was a beautiful discovery. So when we talk about the evolution of the, the flavors and even the product, it was, you know, like I said, chocolate, you know, to Belgians is like our peanut butter and jelly. So it's really kind of changing that perception that it's OK to have chocolate for breakfast in meals. It's a healthy aspect. Now, enter in the Americans and how we like to diversify our palate and the flavor pairings. Um, you know, we really looked at what would make sense for, you know, this delicious Belgian dark chocolate spread and pair it with different flavors. So I was lucky enough to go into the lab and play around with some delicious flavors um, that really we've got about 15 in our vault. Um, four, you see the original and then the three, the caramel sea salt, the coconut and the Caribbean banana that are available now um, that you can purchase all across the United States. And we really kind of looked at what were those flavor profiles that we felt matched the American consumer the best for this phase one. Um, Brom, do you want to add on to that at all? Yeah, so I'm obviously the Belgium guy in the story. Um, but then besides having a American and a Belgium, what we also combine is, is a marketeer. Jennifer with 18 years Red Bull experience and then my background is international business. So you started by saying, Jeremy, that, that certain products are, are, are second nature in certain countries. Uh, when I came to the States in 2002, it, it, and ever since then, and, and until we started LECO in 2017, I've been involved with European products, technologies, and services that I was bringing to the US or I was the, the, the CEO or president of the US subsidiary of those European foreign entities. So my past 25 years have been in business uh, and taking these concepts to, to, to America. And, and as I said last week in a call, I've become so much American that the Americans don't look at me as the crazy European who's a nice guy, but they don't understand, you know, they're like, but he doesn't understand us. And then the Europeans, I'm still a European enough, I'm Belgian enough that the Europeans are not like, oh, here's the crazy American again, asking something that we don't want to give. So I'm this chameleon that goes back and forth between the two. And so I was able to convince our contract manufacturer to go into a path where they've never gone before. And that was create flavors. Because the, the American consumer loves flavors, anything and everything flavor. And so Jen looks at it from that marketing perspective. I look at it very holistically as a company and as a product. And if you, if we're not charting on ter uncharted territory here. The American has proven in his palate of consuming chocolate that he has a keen, a keen interest in flavors. It just happens to be three aisles further in any grocery store where the chocolate bar has exploded as a section in a grocery store from about a three, four foot section to now 15 feet with the most crazy exotic flavor combinations and texture combinations. So others have gone in ahead of us and have created that flavor palette and proven that the American loves caramel sea salt with dark chocolate that he loves orange peel with dark chocolate, that they love coconut with dark chocolate. And so from a business strategy perspective, it makes total sense to bring that and, and now create that combo into a different form of experiencing the product, which is a spreadable. And the reason we picked the spreadable is that the spreadable section is on fire, right? You have the RX bar guys. They have now created a spread, an RX spread. Uh, you had Justin's who led the way. And, and we are in a segment where you have nut butters who've added chocolate to it. And then you have a chocolate spread that has nuts. And what we are, we are the chocolate of chocolate spreads, but with flavors. And that's the positioning of the company. So it's, a, it's very methodical. It's very strategic. And we believe that we really capture a white space that is currently unaddressed. And that's why we're charging full steam ahead. So how did you come up with these flavors? I mean, these specific flavors, when you look at data and different palettes across the United States, we kind of wanted those type of flavors that would really embody a majority of you know, our consumer base. 
So you look at the caramel sea salt. If you look at caramel sea salt as a flavor across the board, just walk the grocery aisles whenever you feel comfortable. You'll see there are a lot of things that are caramel sea salt flavored. Plus it's a very appealing, comforting flavor. Then you have coconut, which has always been, you know, really something that's gravitated, you know, towards certain demographics, um, as well as Caribbean banana, a nice, fresh, kind of natural chocolate combination. You know, you started the podcast out saying, I love Lecco on, on my bananas. So right there, we felt that was a very nice, all natural kind of flavor combination. What are both of your favorites of Lecco and maybe one that maybe it's out of the ordinary, maybe it's not? What do you put on? What do you put your Lecco on? Oh, I'll, I'll take that one as, yeah. as um, it, it reminds me of my childhood, right? It's it's the original is to me the favorite, but that's because what I've been used to uh, and on a slice of bread over toast. However, if I eat it just off the spoon as a little snack in the afternoon, then I go with the with the coconut one because that that almost gives me that almond joy flavor, you know, little snack i just have a late a spoon here just grab a little spoon you know mm. eat it it's like i'm eating a little you know that bounty that european you know bounty snack candy mm -hmm. coconut like an almond that, yeah. that's what it reminds me of and so mm. those are my two favorites jennifer before you answer that if anyone's tuning in now live if you put in the comments what you like eating chocolate with what combination or bonus points for what you eat let go with we are going to be sending free jars. We will choose comments in the chat um, to send free jars to. So please put it in. Jennifer, what are your favorites to eat Lecco with? So I like strawberries. So I will sit and just take a spoon in the original and put it on strawberries and I can crush a flat of strawberries <laughs> like nobody's business. Um, I also, I'm a very seasonal eater. So in the winter with oatmeal, my favorite is a scoop of actually any flavor, but I usually gravitate towards coconut, big tablespoon and hot oatmeal. And I put frozen blueberries on top. And to me, that's just such a delightful mix of flavors. Uh, and it's really hearty and it's healthy. So those are my favorite ways really to eat Lecco. I want to ask too. So Jennifer, for you, I want to know what you learned from Red Bull of what you bring into Lecco. And then Bram, I'll ask you what you brought into what products you saw that you were able to bring to the U.S. that kind of sparked this innovation? So, Jennifer, what did you learn from working with Red Bull for so many years that you brought into Lecco? Yeah. So the, the brilliant thing about working for Red Bull, I started in 96 when the brand launched and no one knew wow. what an energy drink was. Um, even the size can didn't even fit into the glide racks in grocery. So I'm taking people way, way back here. What did so the can was, look like at the time? I picture the slim, the slim. Yeah, yeah, slim can. But no, no one had slim cans at the time. So uh, Red Bull was really the first innovator to bring that to grocery. So, you know, even that is as well as, you know, um, you know, the category itself didn't exist with energy drinks. So when we launched Red Bull in 96, we had to go out and educate people. What is Red Bull? You know, why do you drink it? And so there's so much I learned from Red Bull from mm. connecting with consumers, trial, listening to consumers, how to position yourself in grocery, how to work with your distributors, but also just building that brand ethos. And you don't have to be everyone's darling when you really launch a product or a brand, but you have to find that right niche of consumers and be able to listen to them as well. And so I've got a really full backpack from my days at Red Bull. I'm very thankful for that. I was with them for 18 years. Um, but so much was learned that really we apply to Lecco. A little bit of an easier sell because most people know chocolate, um, but it's talking about the quality of chocolate, our attributes, our benefits, and how it's really healthy indulgence and can be incorporated at every meal of the day, which I'm sure chocolate lovers across the world are rejoicing right now because I just gave them the pass. Keys to the castle of chocolate, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, go. There you go. Yeah. For the Red Bull piece, what did you discover people wanted in the beginning that maybe surprised you? Because, and I'm wondering how the marketing changed over the years because I imagine the beginning, I don't know if originally people were like, oh yeah, let's pair this with vodka, let's pair this with drinks. Maybe, I don't know. What was kind of the thought process in the beginning of what you, the marketing looked like and even the feedback and then how did it change? 
So Rebel existed for 10 years before it came to the States. Uh, so a lot of trial and error of, of Red Bull kind of existed with the ethos of it. Um, pairing it with vodka actually was an accident. It's a, it's a darling story that took place um, in Salzburg, Austria, where kind of the owner shut the doors of this bar, hired a DJ and said, hey, we're staying here all night. Let's just mix Red Bull and Red Bull vodka you know, was kind of born. So it really, for, for that, by the time we came to the United States, how we went about marketing, the core values of the authenticity and the functionality of the product was there and to this day still stands. I think what's evolved and changed is as things have changed, whether it's, um, you know, music, live music, you know, how do you storytell? I mean, you're looking at Rebel website right now, their athlete profiles are phenomenal. Um, then really kind of taking, at least in the Red Bull world, an idea and utilizing the benefits of that product and how do you, you know, kind of maximize, you know, the effects of, of the product. So for example, athletes, you know, how do we make them, you know, a better athlete because of the performance attributes of, you know, of Red Bull. So a lot of what we did at Red Bull when it came to, you know, that as a brand coming to the States is what makes sense with sports um on the collegiate level as well as with music to kind of give wings to people and ideas yeah so, and like it says vitalize this body and mind so what do we do to vitalize that body and mind it's fascinating it must have been fascinating yeah. to take this journey with red bull and oh yeah see, you know i'm sure this can looks different the logo looks different the initiatives no it, no, it looks this, it looks the same looks the same yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly, the only thing that will look different from country to country is whatever whatever language you'll still see vitalizes body and mind in English, but the ingredients um, it will 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 be in the native language. But to be quite honest with you, the slim can still looks the same. Um, brand messaging, the consistency, and you can go anywhere in the world where Red Bull is sold and identify with the brand quite easily. Hmm. So yeah, so, believe it or not, yeah. over twenty years, it's still. Oh. So I want to chime in because it's it's okay we talk about Red Bull because obviously it's a it's a it's a keystone yeah. of why we're doing what we're doing, and it actually is the foundation of of Leco because Jen and I met over Red Bull, right? Mm -hmm. So and it actually answers because I still remember your question, Doctor Jeremy. I want to make sure I answer that one mm -hmm. uh, about what is it that you see or brought from Europe to the U.S. and, and what is the complexity around it. Um, my my early involvement why I came to the U.S. was we were involved with indoor go kart racetracks like the K1 uh, franchise that is out there. Um, that was the business we came with. Um, it is there that I was a Red Bull consumer. I was an early Red Bull consumer in Europe. Um, and, and I made our go-kart track a point of sale for Red Bull and then Red Bull supported our business. And long story short, Jen walked in my office in 2002 in the month of uh, July and everything else is history. And uh, <laughs> We're married for 14 years, uh, no, 16 years. Uh, yeah. soon to be, we have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, uh, Helena and Olivia. Um, now, the answer to the question on what products do you bring through experience, it's a very delicate balance because you can look at what is out there in the world and there's reasons why in certain regions things are what they are. Um, it is key. It's a very key balance, Jeremy, between being too early and being too late. And when are you too early and when are you too late? And what are those factors and what do you need to look at? I'll be I'll be honest. We were too early with the go-kart stuff. We went out and it's only later on because there's a, there's a, it's a very complex model and the American mind needed to grow and gravitate to go-kart racing. So we, we left that business behind. And in the print technology that I was involved in, I've seen what it takes when you're too early and certain components that are underlaying, let's say, computer powering, right? Like processing powering. There were certain print machines that could do something, but the computing power wasn't there, so it couldn't fully function. So, but you need to have something lead and then something else pulls, right? And what is that? The benefit of a jar of chocolate spread is that's quite simple, right? It's a jar of chocolate spread, and someone needs to consume it, you need to find and motivate that person to eat it. But even there, you can be too early or you can be too late. Mm -hmm. So a common misconception on us is that people always little smirky, like little smiling, like, oh, let's not say the word, right, of the guys you compete against. <laughs> We're like, no, we don't compete against them. We have no problem mentioning them. It's Nutella. Without Nutella, there is no Leco. Mm -hmm. Nutella is part of Ferrero. Ferrero is a billion dollar, like, what, 30, 40 billion dollar valued company, and they happen to have a brand Nutella. 
they the brand was available in the US almost to parallel distribution it was a moment where Ferrero came to the US directly Ferrero is putting tons of money in the US market on educating the, the U, uh, US consumer what do you do with chocolate spread hands our question people what do you pair it with what would you do it with it's one of the leading questions so if that is the leading question you have to think about two things it drives our own storytelling so anybody who goes to check out our social media um and Jen will give the handles in a bit it's all about storytelling what do you do with leco what can you do with leco how do you eat it how do you consume it can you be creative with it but then having a big brand like nutella lead the way for us that is to us um, a driver of why we why jen and i as a, as a married couple they're like in our 40s like let's try this because it was one of the indicators of timing there is no yet there's no no second leading brand behind nutella you have nutella and there's a gap and then the question is why is the gap there because in normal grocery what you find is for every coca-cola there's a pepsi there's an rc just like in fast food you have mcdonald's you have burger king you have wendy's uh when you look at little little um, paper tissues you have puffs you have kleenex right you have private label you have high end so if you look at the grocery dynamic you always have a lead brand second lead brand maybe a third private label high end who's the second brand behind nutella there isn't so that has very much driven the the the, the business strategy and identifying that white space where we want to be the alternative brand who's also a better for you brand mm -hmm. and and it's this it's gut jeremy you and i are how we met right we're part of this this great program the goldman sachs Ten Thousand small business program shout out to the chicago cohort 28 chapter a lot of people try to a lot of people try to over analyze and over uh you know create theories about it but a lot is gut feeling jeremy because what is the right timing when are you too early when are you too late well guess what business practice will tell you and and that is why talking about a company culture what are we trying to do is we, we try to make decisions fast and and listen and look at what we learn real fast so that we can pivot real fast so we don't we don't hold on to our decision making we just evolve on a day-to-day -day basis with that decision making because that's the only way you can know how to pivot and navigate being too early being too late does that make sense yeah i'm just distracted by the chocolate babka no i'm just <laughs> yeah, kidding like no i'm looking through the recipes here you know it makes perfect sense i love to hear and i'm just you know uh, encourage people to go to leco.com uh, slash recipes. If you're watching the video and not just listening to the audio, I am scrolling through some, what looks like um, some amazing things, uh, uh, desserts and foods yeah. that you can use it with. So you could check it out, get ideas. Um, and at what point, so you meet, at what point do you go, let's launch this chocolate company, this Belgium chocolate company together? Yeah, I mean, you know, with, you know, let's Brahma, complicate our marriage even more. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, that's, and actually our story is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's truly about, you know, a marriage of skill set. It's about a marriage of, you know, a husband and wife. It's a marriage of ambition, of opportunity, and honestly, a love of chocolate. You know, um, you know, our daughters have been raised on chocolate spread for breakfast. They have chocolate every morning for breakfast. I know that sounds crazy, but they do. It's part of who they are. And, whether it's an oatmeal or on their waffles or in a, you know, a sandwich, it's, it's something that they eat, you know, or strawberries. It's great. So for us really, you know, it started with, we're at my in-laws back, you know, backyard and they live in the South of France, uh, which we're very lucky to, to still have them with us and be able to go there. And we used to always bootleg chocolate spreads and other products back from Europe. And we would give it to friends and they would say, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. There's nothing like this here in the States. Um, you know, there's the nut component of Nutella, hazelnuts. I think, you know, you either really like that flavor or it's an acquired taste. So there wasn't a pure Belgian dark chocolate spread. So it really was a what if conversation. It was, Brom, what if we, you know, brought a Belgian dark chocolate spread to the States? We started talking about it and, you know, what would go into it. You know, with our backgrounds between international business running companies and then obviously with Red Bull, knowing what it's like to scale in a country like the United States, which it is a big deal. Um, once you hit that tipping point and you go beyond your, your kind of local market, 
you've got to get ready, you know, and that is, you know, supply, you know, your marketing, um, your distribution route. And so we spent a lot of time talking about what that looked like. And really what it came down to to start was the right contract manufacturer and who could work with us and grow with us. Um, really, and it, the, the question of our skill set and us working together, I mean, people say, oh, you're, you're married. And especially now in times of the pandemic, it is 24 seven with the ones you love. Um, but we have found a way to make it work and we really complement each other's skill set and we work together very well. And I'll, I'll let Bram chime in as well. Yeah, so, so the moment truly really was 2014, July on the back deck of my parents. But then we went through a, a three year process, a full three years, 14, 15, 16, and we started the company on January 10, 2017. And we, we took that, that initial journey and that initial timeline to really draft out that, that blueprint. Because the beauty of America, what really drove me to come to the States, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the immigrant, right? I was 28. I left my life behind in Belgium. People didn't understand it. I actually worked in TV, Jeremy. I was a television director. Mm. That's my background there. Tele television director and I raced rally cars. And... And, and people are like, why are you going to America? And I've always been intrigued. First of all, I'm, I'm fundamentally a very curious individual. I'm always looking like, oh, this could be interesting. Let's, I want to know more about that and let it be what it is. But what really intrigued me was the unmatched scalability of a single good idea and a single good product in the U.S. There's not a market in the world that covers this continent, east to west, north to south, where you have an internal market of 330 million people that with a, a simple, delicious product at $5.99 available in any grocery store, hopefully in the next four or five years, there's not a single market out there like the U.S. But then you have to understand before you start in an adventure like that, what are all the components that you need to make sure that that scalability can follow? So as Jen mentioned, your contract manufacturer, if scaling is the objective, if then scaling would lead to, to the bottleneck being manufacturing, yeah, then, then why are you starting? Because you can't fall flat. So, for example, in August 2020, Kroger took us nationwide. We're in, in 1,600 Kroger's nationwide. Uh, we're in 42 uh, metro markets. Uh, we're in 2,250 stores, right, all along. You need to be able to, to gear up on a dime and make sure you can digest going into 1,600 stores. And and that is I can only see a lot of challenges there. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's capital. There's there's capital restraint. There's working capital. There's there's manufacturing. There's, but but if you want to play ball with the big guys, right? Then then you better have this all figured out. Here's a bit of the the irony. If we're talking to other food entrepreneurs, it has never been more easy, Jeremy, to enter the market with a food company. You can buy online 500 empty jars, uh, download a little software on your computer, make a label. Right. And, and now you can send it to an online to an e-store platform and you get your label printed. It comes home. You put it in the kitchen. You, you make whatever you make that you want to bring to market. You incorporate uh, through whatever dot com that sets you a legal entity. Go to a farmer's market. Now you can tell all your friends we have a food company. Mm -hmm. So many people do that. And, and kudos to them. Right. It's, it's good. It's everybody starts with their dream. But it made the, the entry, the, the, the ease of entry is so easy right now to do that, while at the same time, to scale and go play with the big guys, it has never been more complicated. Mm -hmm. Never been more complicated. And that is why... Because of the competition or why? Market conditions, Jeremy. Consolidation. Um, it, it's it's COVID. COVID did not make it easy for us. We have to pivot. We can talk about that. But if you look at consumer, you're a brand new brand that in August goes into Kroger nationwide. And here's the behavior of the mom. The average mom in America has changed. They, she puts everything on Instacart. Or if she's in the store, she just grabs what she needs and she's in and out because of the pandemic, right? The, the time. The They're not browsing the around for new products. They are basically going to what they know and they're not exploring. You yeah. can't sample in the store. You can't go to events. You can't put your name. We just, there. here's the idea. Just go to the, all the Kroger's, buy out all the Nutella, because then, you know, when you go to Instacart, it's like substitute. So people forget to do the substitute. Then you just get all the substitute orders. But Jeremy, let's make no. it easy. Let's tell everybody to not buy the Nutella. I know. I'm saying you'll be the single best buyer of it. And then everyone else will have to get uh, Leco.
but but yeah. back to the point of of how easy it is to start and why 99% of starting food companies fail it is that there's so many hurdles to overcome yeah that that ultimate scaling and those that make it it is so 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 complicated too many are too early a lot of them are too late um, if you're right, are you financially backed? Uh, can you manufacture? Can you grow to scale? Uh, we made mistakes, Jeremy, so many that, that we don't even want to start in the podcast how many we, but the mistakes that are being made is not the problem. It's make sure you identify them as early as you can that it was a mistake and make sure you find a path to correct them. And that is the roller coaster yeah. around. Yeah. What was a key mistake that led to a great either innovation or part of the company? I mean, I think it's our packaging, quite honestly. Um, you know, when we entered the market, we had a different label design. We were manuf manufacturing glass. We thought, fantastic. Um, then you come to find out when you're in retail and you have a POP display, a uh, point of purchase display, the retailers hate that. Why? Because if someone bumps into your display and it's glass, it, it's all over the floor. Uh, it's also heavier to ship. Um, you know, we are sold as well on Amazon. So, you know, Amazon doesn't handle glass products. So if we wanted to play in that arena, we had to take that into consideration. Um, so here we thought, you know, out of the gate, you know, and now you see our our, our jars in, you know, uh, environmentally safe PET plastic. Um, you know, we had to pivot, we had to change. Even our labeling, we felt at, at, in the beginning, like Brom said, you can make a label. It, it was good, but it wasn't great. And it really didn't describe what our product was about. You know, nowadays, you know, when people were shopping the aisles and spending a little more time, you really have about three seconds to make an impression on a consumer. Three seconds. So your label better tell the story pretty quickly. Um, so we really felt changing our label, our packaging uh, was the right next evolution and step. For I'll sure. chime in on that, Jeremy. So so here, and this is so funny because this, this shows why it's working between Jen and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen answers you from that consumer engagement, right? The label, can they read it? Can they not? What is the perception of glass, plastic? I look at, it's the business me the business metrics underneath it. Um, we went to Juul. You you go through your margin calculations on a, on a paper napkin initially, and, and everything starts from what is your suggested retail price. When we got into Juul, where we thought our suggested retail price was $9.99, and we had modeled a margin structure underneath because there's there's a lot of businesses that are involved. I I, I describe it as such. Leco as a brand is a brand to business to the consumer, which is a B two C. However, our business model is a B the brand to B to B to B to C, which is the brand to the distributor, the sales broker, the grocery store. Those are all four Bs. To the consumer because only if those four are in line can the consumer find it to buy it when the brand message makes the consumer want to buy it so you have to marry this very complex right yeah. brand to the consumer in communication and now this very complex underlaying metric to scale you have to figure this out the, these four entities plus the consumer this is now translated to your product price setting it, it starts with what is the cost to make it what can I sell it for? What are the margins that everybody needs to make ultimately to set a suggested retail price? Well, we set it at $9.99. And when we went into Jewel Direct here in Chicago as a local company, Jewel put our product for $6.99 on the shelf. Jeremy, what that did, and to the listeners, what it did effectively, it undermined and wiped out our entire margin structure to scale our business nationwide. And it was compromised over launching in 160 stores. Now, what do you do with this? Go back to the drawing boards. We were sitting in front of somebody, an industry expert, and he flank out told me, you're completely effed and you can't recover from that. Well, my personality doesn't take that, nor Jen. So there's always a way out, but you had to go back. And so what was our solution was go from a 14 ounce glass jar of which I could only ship about 18,000 in a 40 foot container go to a nine and a half ounce plastic jar where now I can ship 50,000 jars in a container. So, and then the, the suggested retail is actually not $6.99 anymore. It's $5.99. And then with $5.99, we were able to solve our entire margin 
you know, chain, which you have to have in place to scale, we were able to preserve that, model that, and operate proper again. So we dodged that bullet. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, next time someone eats a jar of anything, especially let go, think of how much goes into that <laughs> and the evolution of that. It's, it's pretty remarkable to hear about it. I want to hear about the first retail order. That's always, the first is always exciting. Yeah, you take that one, Han. That one's a fun it's, story. It's, it's a, a little Jewish deli on the North Shore in Skokie. Skokie, yep. I've, what, what's it called? Do you remember? Kaufman's Deli. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to two great ladies, mom and a daughter. And, and they were literally our first $77.88. Yeah. And, and they wanted it. They loved it. They liked it. We went there and, and our first order was literally delivered in the back of the car with our two kids in the back of the, the, the vehicle as well. <laughs> Just go drop off that product. And then, you know, you're like Jen, Jen with her background of Red Bull, we, we promised every retailer that took us to come and sample in the store. And why? And this was literally Jen on the table. Because yeah. at the end, your brand story and what you engage with and what you tell to a consumer only by telling your story yourself directly to your consumer will you notice what are they resonating with and what are they dismissing, right? If you start telling, hey, man, you want a little sample, you want to try it, and if they shrug their shoulders, the next time you're going to leave your, your question with a different uh, attribute of our product, right? If, if nobody seemed to care about the sugar content, well, then start maybe with the better flavor or whatever it is that you need to pitch. So Jen was out weekends in a row. And so that first sell... April 1st, 2017, 12 jars, 70, $77.88 as a check. We still have the check. And then the idea that that first sampling, I think, what, Jen, six, seven people bought a jar? Yeah. And we were so giddy, Jeremy, that like that means six, seven households will have a Sunday breakfast yeah. and have Lecco on their table. We're like, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Like, how cool is that? And that's one of those little silly pinch moments, you know what I mean? And then it just evolves, right? Once you get into Jewel, now you're in 160 stores. Now the whole Chicago land can get to know your product. And then you go to Kroger. And now the idea that our product is in 42 metro markets, 42 major cities in America. You go from San Diego to LA, all the way to Seattle, or you go you know, across the US, all the way to the Midwest, all the way to the Carolinas, Atlanta. There's 42 metro markets that carry Leco. And we started this April 1st, 2017. I love that. First of all, I have one last question for both of you. I want, before I ask it, I want to just tell people they can check out letco.com. It's L E K K C O.com. Check out the products that they have available. They're really good. I've tried them all um, and check it out. Um, the, where can, other people find, like we talked about Jewel, Kroger, where else can people, Amazon, where else can people find Leco? Well, I mean, it depends where you live in the United States. We're in Ralph's, uh, Mariano's, locally here in the Chicagoland area, Dylan's, King Supers, QFC, Fred Meyer, um, Smith's, Fry's. So these are all banner stores of Kroger across the United States. Uh, of course, Kroger stores. Amazon.com. Uh, if you are a coffee shop and or a bakery and you are on the fair platform, we do make you know our product available for smaller format kind of stores and local stores um, on fair.com. Um, that's not necessarily public facing, uh, but then and also our own.com, of course, which you had up. Last question. OK, this is really interesting to me. Um, you know, we talked and I, I showed a little about Red Bull and when I, when I look at your site, um, the recipes look amazing. Um, but I would love to know who are the brand ambassadors that you see are really taking Leco to the next level. And it could be individual people and it could be types of people. Like I see chef Karina here. Yeah. I don't know who chef Karina is, but I could see chefs being a brand ambassador. How did you connect with Chef Karina and who are the other brand ambassadors? So Chef Karina is actually our in-house chef and she comes from oh. the College of DuPage. Nice. So we do partner with them with their internship program. So we do give young talent, our videographer, photographer, and our chef, and actually our, our marketing uh, assistant all came from COD. 
um, called you DuPage and we give real life and real world, real environment, working experience. They are an integral part of our team. Um, so for us, that's obviously you know, somewhat of an ambassador. Uh, also, I mean, it is, you know, the, the local home chef, the chefs, the moms, you know, who are making products with their kids or for their family, um, anyone who likes to cook, uh, they're really our ambassadors, um, you know, and really we get recipes all the time that come our way. Hey, have you tried Leco this way? Or I just made this recipe and they tag us all the time on social media. Um, and so, you know, Brown will answer as well, you know, his vision of, you know, of our ambassadors. Well, we're actually we're actually in the midst of rolling out a, a large scale opportunity where in every four in, in all 42 metro markets, we're going to go and hire um, moms, specific profile of mom, because we believe in the power of word of mouth and moms referring moms to our product. And so we're actually actively recruiting and hiring for each of the 42 metro markets that we're in uh, to bring, you know, uh, what we call the lack of market maker, somebody who can have their local market as a territory where they'll help us to position LECO in their community. Um, a, a big uh, a big focus for us is be a better company in every aspect of it, from being a better product, a better health-wise, a lower calorie, lower sugar, but also give back. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have great goals and ambitions personally to create much larger awareness around dyslexia. But in the first place, what we want to do is tap into those 42 metro markets and set up fundraisers or allow people to be our ambassador. And then with the proceeds of product sales that come in that market, that we can give back to those local communities. And that is an active program that we are starting to build right now. I would say, uh, if you want to submit your resume and you want to become a brand ambassador mm -hmm. for LACO in your market, there are all the, the chains in the markets that you can buy us. Uh, I would say send it to hello at LACO. So H-E-L-L-O at Leco and Leco is L-E-K-K-C-O dot com. Uh, you know, reach out and, and we would love to engage with you and see how we can bring make you our ambassador in your market for Leco. Everyone, check out Leco.com. Check out your nearest store, Amazon, everywhere else. First of all, I want to be the first one to thank both of you for sharing your story and the Belgium chocolate also with the U.S. And we'll yeah. see you next time, everyone. Thanks, both of you. Yes. Bye guys. Bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.